You've lived a great life and done well for yourself. But what mark will you leave on the world? How will you inspire future generations? Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand have helped thousands of people answer exactly those questions. If you've ever wondered, what will be my legacy? You're in the right place. Welcome to the Your Life, Your Legacy podcast. Now, here are your hosts, Stan and Katie Beth. Hey, this is Steve Enting, your host with Legacy Stories, and I'm very excited today to be introducing Lauren Doyle with TLD Law. Lauren is a business and estate planning attorney with TLD Law. She specializes in corporate counseling, business succession planning, and estate and tax planning. Lauren has been recognized as a 40 under 40 business leader in Orange County in 2020. She's also a nominee for the Orange County Business Journal's 2020 Women in Business Award. Lauren, thanks for joining us today. Great, thank you for having me. Yes, yeah. so um, I, yeah, I'm an estate planning attorney um, and I'm actually a second generation estate planning and business planning attorney with our firm Treadway, Lumsdain and Doyle. Um, our firm is over 60 years old. Uh, we have about 20 attorneys um, based out of Orange County and the Los Angeles area, so regional firm. And we are full service. So in addition to estate planning, we pretty much do it all. Yeah, that's great. Um, very good to know for our listeners. Um, and we'll get into a little bit of, uh, you know, more about the firm uh, down the, uh, in a few minutes, but let's talk about you for a little bit. Um, why did you go to law school? What made you decide to go into law? Yeah, so um, first of all, my dad, Mark Doyle, is an attorney and he is our most senior partner. So he has been an inspiration for me. He's been practicing about 40 years. Um, so I grew up around this stuff, around the dinner table, hearing these stories. Um, but really, I didn't want to go to law school right out the gate. Um, I enjoyed writing and journalism. So I went to uh, undergrad at NYU for journalism, and I worked for some magazines there, um, interned uh, as a, a writer at Rolling Stone and, and Cosmopolitan Magazine and a couple other ones, um, which was super fun, really enjoyed that. Um, but I graduated in 08. So it was a difficult time to get a job anywhere, let alone in journalism. So I decided to uh, look back at, you know, what areas I was good at reading, writing, um, and thought, okay, I'm going to just give law school a try. Um, and I loved it. I ended up really loving it. Um, I loved the reading and analysis. Um, I wasn't so much of a public speaker, but I'm a very detailed writer and researcher. And so the public speaking part has had to kind of come second. Um, but yeah, so loved law school, um, worked at, clerked at a few firms, um, and ended up really just coming back to Treadway, Lundstein, and Doyle because I just loved our culture here. Um, I love the attorneys here. And in my experience, it was one of the best uh, work experience environments that I had been in. They really give you a lot of hands-on practical experience and let you interact with the clients. Um, so it's just, you know, it was a great opportunity for me. But yes, so I wasn't intent wasn't initially going to go to law school, but uh, it sort of led me there. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can definitely sense that, um, that enthusiasm. You know, everybody has their own experience and, and, and reasons why they get into the field. Um, but uh, why estate planning? Yeah, so our firm is full service in that we practice in most areas. And when you start out as an attorney here, you have to really do everything. Um, and, and, and it's good that they make you do that. So I spent the first like five years going to court, um, you know, doing employment lawsuits, trust litigation, lots of different areas. Um, but I slowly made my way into the estate planning area, more into our transactional department, I would say. So out of the litigation, out of the fighting and more into the deal making. Um, and I just found that I really enjoyed my estate planning and take meetings with people. Um, I enjoyed hearing about their families and their kids, what was important to them. Um, and I, there's this thing that says um, you can find a lot of meaning in your own life by helping people do something that's meaningful to them. And I felt like that I was really helping people do meaningful stuff. And so it just felt good to do that work. Um, I felt like I was good at it. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of where I've stayed. Um, but I also do business planning too. So I get a little bit of the personal and then I also get the business aspect too, which has personal sides to it as well. 
because I work with the business owners and so forth. So, um, but yeah, that's how I got there. Oh, that's great. That's good for our our, our, our our listeners who are interested in learning more about, you know, certain aspects of TLD law and specifically what you do. Um, you know, business succession planning, I think also is a big, big deal these mm -hmm. days. Um, and we see that a lot. Um, so, you know, it, it in terms of ideal clients, who would you say, or, you know, would be somebody you would identify as, as a, an ideal client uh, for you specifically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I work with lots of different types of people, but I'd say I really like working with young families and young professionals. Um, as soon as you buy a home, um, as soon as you have kids, you really do need an estate plan. Um, and you need that so you can appoint guardians for your children at the very least, um, and you need it to avoid probate if you own your home. Um, so really, um, young professionals, I feel like, are great because um, they're young enough where, you know, maybe they're not thinking about this stuff, but they should be. Um, the services are, you know, when I was, I'm 37, so when I was in my 20s, these services felt too expensive for me. Um, now that I'm a professional and I understand the value of them, um, I, I've noticed that people in my generation are really starting to understand the importance of these documents and, and getting them done. So I, I really like that kind of young uh, professional that really wants to make sure they're doing everything correctly um, and are looking at these issues that are sometimes really hard to look at when you're young, you know, who wants to think about death and all that, so. Yeah, I, you know, that you bring up such a good point because it, there's such a huge misconception out there that estate planning, all of this is meant for somebody when they're in their 50s or 60s and, you know, when they're older. And so it's 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 something that they put off. Right. But the reality yeah. is it's 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 somebody who even as soon as they get married, whether it's in their 20s or 30s and, you know, start acquiring assets, those are those are people that are you know, probably it, it's, it's important, just as important, if not more important, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, one area that I, I know it's, it comes up in the news a lot, but um, not everybody knows about it is once you have adult children, once your kids turn 18, um, you technically cannot go make medical decisions for them anymore, even though you're their parent. Uh, so we have a lot of kids that are parents that their kids are going out to college and they will set up just a health care directive and a will, something small like that, because we did have a case where uh, a student, a, a client of ours, their daughter went to school around here and her second year in college, she had some sort of like mental break and she was in a coma. Well, her parents couldn't even come visit her in the hospital because they didn't have a health care directive that allowed them to come visit her. Um, so we had to actually go in ex parte, which is, means speeded up, expensive, um, into court to get a conservatorship over her. Um, and had she just had that simple form, um, all of that would have been avoided. So I definitely think there is a misconception that it's only for the elderly and only for the wealthy, because it really is most people should have, have at least some piece uh, of an estate plan. Yeah, what, what valuable education there. Um, what would you say are some common issues that you would help with? Um, so uh, areas where I see kind of, you know, a nightmare scenario would be people that put together kind of what I call self-help. Um, so they are maybe going online like LegalZoom or something like that and trying to put together their own estate plan themselves. And I think, you know, it's great that they uh, I think there that things like LegalZoom are, uh, you know, allowing that education to be out there, that it is important to have these documents. At the same time, they're not providing legal services to you. They say that on their website. And so what we get oftentimes is a trust that's set up, um, but there's nothing in it. So mm -hmm. the important thing about setting a trust up is connecting your assets to it. Um, and so I see a lot of times people set a trust up, but they never deeded their home into their trust. They never put their bank accounts, titled them into their trust. So it does no good for us. They pass away, those assets go through probate. So um, I think that that's a big thing I see. Um, another unusual one, but I have seen it come up a few times, is people will refinance their home and the lender will only loan to them individually. So they'll say, okay, we'll take the home out of the trust will lend to you and then we'll put it back in for you. Well, lender never puts it back in. So trust, so home is outside the trust. Now I have to go to court to fix that. Um, so I think the self-help work where you're not really having a professional check it out for you, 
Um, I also think uh, people that try to do their own amendments. I had a case where um, they had done a full estate plan with our firm. And then instead of just coming back to do a, a small amendment to change how they wanted their property disposed of, they wanted one of their kids to get the home and the rest mm -hmm. to be split amongst the others. They didn't do the amendment correctly. So we had to end up selling the home um, and that child wasn't able to keep it. Even though that was probably what mom wanted, she didn't come to an attorney and, and do the right formalities that you needed to make it uh, legally binding. So I see that kind of stuff. Um, but I say, I see a lot of where I see like the problems coming up because so I'm doing estate planning. I'm the planner, but I'm also doing trust administration. So when the people that set up the trust pass away, I help the next person in line, that successor trustee, make sure we get all the assets down to the next generation. And during that process, litigation can arise, mm -hmm. um, you know, lots of kind of pitfalls in there. So one of the things I see, and you've probably heard it a lot here, is there is a lot of elder abuse out there. Um, my advice is to, if you are, have elderly parents and you're an adult child, to stay in touch with your parents. Um, you know, I have clients that come to me and the classic case is a caretaker takes advantage of an older person and they change their will to leave things to them. Um, but I see it a lot just within families. So I'll see adult children that are, you know, busy, have their own lives, they're friends, you know, they're close with their parents, but not really close. And then there'll be one sibling that's maybe doing everything. They're living with mom and dad, they're running all the errands, taking all the doctor's appointments. They, then they start putting themselves on all their bank accounts. Um, then they, in, in some bad actors, not everybody, but some of the cases I see, then they start going, taking mom to see a new estate planning attorney and they start changing things. Um, so usually when the client hires me um, and this stuff has happened, there's like not a lot we can do once it's been done. Uh, we do do those cases a lot. Um, a lot of fighting families get used to that, but I, it's always, I always ask, well, when was the last time you saw your mom? Like, when did you go visit her? And they say, well, last Christmas, or we're so busy. I have my own kids. It's really hard for me to stay in touch. Well, it, it's that when they lose that touch, that, you know, communication with them, I see mm -hmm. that undue influence really can like come into play. So um, that would be my one area. And then another area would be um, when you're, if you're going to be leaving things to your family um, in an, what we call an unnatural disposition, meaning most people leave things to their kids um, if in equal shares. So if you plan on leaving things to two of your kids, but not one of them, and you're gonna disinherit them, you're allowed to do that, or you can do what you want with your estate, but you really should maybe let them know, get a heads up, and at the very least, write a letter as to why you're doing that. Because I think the surprise and the shock and the hurtfulness of when a parent passes away and they do that, and the child is not expecting it, that can make them go hire an attorney and sue their siblings and say, you did this with mom and dad, all that stuff. So I, I think, but I have clients that are very reluctant to want to share that with their kids in some cases. And I say, you know, you're, you know, they're like, I don't want to cause a problem now. I'm like, well, you're going to cause a worse problem when you pass away and you're not there to explain why you did what you did. So um, yeah, those I say would be the, the big, big areas of conflict. Yeah. Those sound like very common scenarios, right? Uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, as a lot of our, our listeners uh, uh, processes, they realize this is probably right. You know, in their family, the, uh, you know, maybe their family dynamics fit a lot of the things that you talk about. So I think it's important that um, the education has to be there, right? Um, and it's out of sight, out of mind a lot of the time. So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm glad that you brought up some of those things. Now, along that line, um, you know, what are some common misconceptions? Um, well, I think we kind of talked, touched on it earlier that people don't think they need these plans at all. Um, they think they're only for the wealthy. They think probate, you know, not a big deal. Um, but probate here in California, um, and for those of you, I'm not sure if your listeners know about the probate process in California, but if you don't have a trust, if you have no planning documents or just a will, uh, your estate will go through probate, meaning a court process. And that court process takes time. So the first problem with it is it takes a long time. 
when you have a trust and the creators pass away, we can usually wrap it up within six months to a year. With a probate, we're looking at many years. Lots of notification has to go out. Lots of procedures, hearings have to be scheduled. Um, it, it's a lengthy process. It's also a costly process. So people think, well, I'm not going to spend, you know, $3,500 on an estate plan. That's too expensive. But in California, probate is based on the, what you pay in probate depends on the size of your estate. <clears throat> it's a sliding scale. So right now, if you have an estate worth a million dollars, which if you live in Orange County and you own a home, you probably have a million dollars, you will pay $46,000 in probate fees. So when you look at $46,000 versus $3,500, you know, it just, I think the common misconception is, oh, I'm saving money mm -hmm. by just, you know, letting someone else, deal, letting my kids deal with it. Um, so yeah, I would say that would be, would be a big one. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, that is a good one. Um, and so you've talked about some things of, uh, of, of situations that have gone wrong or could go wrong, but can you think of a situation or specific example or case that has gone right? Uh, like a success story? Yeah, yeah. so um, there's been a few, I would say one, it's, it's successful, but it's sad. So one would be a young couple that I worked with um, that had young children and they didn't have much, um, but they were both diagnosed with illnesses that were, could potentially be terminal, um, one more so than the other. Um, and so they came in and I had to plan with them about their potentially, them potentially passing away within the next year. And it was unusual because usually when I talk with people, especially young people, we kind of joke about these things like, okay, scenarios like all right let's say you're on a plane to Hawaii and it goes down who do we leave things to you know we can kind of like joke but we re I could not do that in that case because it was just very um, real for them and so but it was good in the sense that they were able to put together a letter very specific to their guardians about how they wanted their kids to be raised it was a very hard thing for them to do but it was you know what kind of church they wanted them to go to how they wanted them to use their cell phone usage and social media it was things that they like had to sit down and write down and think about as instructions to potential guardians for their children that was a very real possibility um, so that to me while it was very sad um, was good because we've i've brought some peace of mind to them in a time that's really hard for them so i felt like that was a very good situation um and then there's like smart planning so i, I think of, of that planning going well for example um i do a lot of planning uh in the property tax area so in california our property taxes can be very high um property taxes are based on what you purchase a piece of real estate for and it increases a little bit each year. In California, back in the 60s, we put some laws in place that said mom and dad can transfer their home and other property to their kids and the property taxes stay the same. Well, there's been some new laws that came into effect. Prop 19 was passed and it went into effect in 2021 that limited that what we call the parent-child exclusion. And it said, now mom and dad can't pass anything they want down. They can only pass their primary residence as long as their child will also use it as their primary residence. And that's it. Mm -hmm. So any other property that they own, when they pass away or they sell or change ownership, that prop the property taxes will get reassessed. Meaning instead of somebody paying $2,500 a year for property taxes, they're going to be paying ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year going forward. So it's, these are like big jumps. Um, I see this come up um, in the a lot of clients that have inherited um, family property through generations. Um, so mom and dad bought a house on I don't know if you're familiar with the area, but down here in Newport Beach on the peninsula, those houses are worth you know ten million dollars now. But they bought them for about they were practically giving them away in the sixties. So, you know. $500, you could get a lot down there. Mm -hmm. um, so as you can imagine, those property taxes are very low. They were based on that $500 those people paid for it back in the 60s. If they get a reassessment, well, now we're looking at 1.1% of 10 million is what you're going to be paying um, every year. So it's a huge jump. So we did do some smart planning around Prop 18. 
it was voted on and approved in December. And I had some clients do some uh, gifting and moving uh, real estate into legal entities uh, such that they could avoid that whole property tax reassessment. So we did that for a few people, got them in that window. There are still things we can do now um, to avoid that. But I think just like thinking ahead and smart planning, thinking about if you have this legacy of real estate that you want to leave to your kids, um, these property tax issues can really, um, if you're not planning around them, you're, it's not going to be sustainable for the kids to be able to maintain the property at those property tax values. So um, good planning takes that into consideration. Yeah. 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 Um, really, I, I think it, 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 you look at a lot of case by case situations and um, the, the, you know, you, you, you kind of learn from it, right? Um, you learn from a lot of the examples that you talk about, and um, and I'm sure you've gone through a lot of these examples and gone through a lot of individual um, scenarios. Um, what would you say is one aspect that you really like best about what you do? Hmm. Um, as I said earlier, I really do like helping people. Um, it is that sense of relief that they get um, when, like they will have things keeping them up at night about how this is going to work or that's going to work and who, what's going to happen, who's going to take care of our business with that. Um, so to be able to create something for them that like takes that off their brain and they're not worried about that stuff anymore. Um, that's probably what I get the most joy. And I do enjoy like unusual problems. So that's why I like the property tax stuff. I do a lot of appeals in that area. Um, so I like kind of complicated areas, but another area I do is nonprofit work. So I help people form um, 501c3s, um, and that is super rewarding. Like I had somebody that um, she received as an inheritance, a piece of property, and we were able to turn it into a, an animal rehab and re, uh, rehab center, basically, that was a nonprofit. So it just felt like even just me doing the legal aspect of it, you feel like you're helping that cause. Um, so that's that's another area I like doing as well. Yeah, um, great. Tell can you tell our listeners where they can find you? Yes, um, you can find me. Well, I'm located physically in Orange County, California, Irvine. Um, our offices are Orange County and Los Angeles. Um, I am helping clients though all throughout the state of California. You can find me at our firm website, tldlaw.com or Treadway, Lumsdain, and Doyle. Um, if you click on my profile, there's an option to be able to make a free consultation with me, a little 15-minute Zoom or call um, to see if, if there's something we can help you with or I can answer questions, and um, that would be the best place to find me. Yeah, fantastic. And, um, you know, again, it's it's uh, – I'm, I'm always even – for personally, I've heard a lot of these stories, but I feel like I'm always getting a little bit of nuggets here and there, little things that, you know, things that you talked about today that even for me has, hits home, right? Um, so I really appreciate um, a lot of your insights. Um, I really want to thank you for joining us today. Um, you know, and for our listeners, uh, this has been Stephen Ting with Legacy Stories Podcast. You know, uh, Lauren Doyle, uh, we've been here spending some time with her uh, and, and she's been gracious enough to share a lot of her experience. Uh, for those of you that uh, want to reach out to her, we will have her information, contact information available. Uh, she certainly knows her stuff. So, you know, we're pretty, pretty excited to have her on. Um, and again, so thank you, Lauren, for spending the time with us. And again, everybody, thank you for watching and listening. And we will see you again next time. Uh, this is Stephen Ting. Great. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Your Life, Your Legacy podcast with Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. If you enjoyed the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. To find out more about Stan and Katie Beth, go to PinnacleLegacyLaw.com. You can also find links in the show notes.